Welcome to Females and Fine Fettle, from Wiped Out to Wealthy. This is where conscientious women entrepreneurs and women living like a boss come to learn about balancing their personal and professional wellness with ease. If you have the enthusiasm, motivation, and grit to make it happen, then listen up every Monday. To be sure you don't miss an episode, sign up for weekly updates at femalesandfinefettle.com. The following discussion is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease. Please don't apply any of this information without first speaking with your doctor. Now, here are your hosts, Denise Pasquinelli and Dr. Michelle, your natural women's health advocates who blend the wisdom of ancient healing traditions and the science of functional medicine. Hey, and welcome back to another episode. Today, we're taking a piece from our Funky Five and diving a bit deeper. We're going to be talking about boundaries in relation to our work and professional life and how to manage our time, prioritize the tasks that will make the biggest impact during our day, and how to use the concept of essentialism to create sustainable working habits and avoid burnout. Yes, this topic (laughs) is so important. Consider that we spend an average of 92,000 hours at work in our lifetime. And for many of us, we take our work stressors home in a way that influences the way we spend our time outside of work, meaning our work life makes a big impact on the overall quality of our lives. So creating smart boundaries in our working life helps us to enjoy the rest of our lives even more. In the last episode, episode 47, we mentioned that book, Essentialism, which is a great book if you're interested in this topic. And in it, he says, if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. And boy, oh boy, does that resonate when it comes to our working lives, right? (laughs) So let's jump in. Dr. Michelle, how do you rock out with smart boundaries at work? Oh, well, let me tell you. (laughs) So... (laughs) You know, one of the things that I mentioned last week was how I utilize time blocks. Now, there are several strategies around this, so you'll have to find what what works best for you. But one of my favorite ways to do this is by using Brain FM. I know I've talked about this app in previous episodes, but I'm still a huge fan, and they're making updates all the time. They actually just added a piano focus session not too long ago, which I was really stoked about. Um, But anyways, they use Mm -hmm. auditory neuroscience to help you focus. Um, And you can actually set their built-in timer for 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, or you can just have it on continuous play. But that kind of goes against the purpose of the time block, right? So I like setting it for one to two hours. And then when the music stops, that's my cue to get up, stretch, walk around, or, you know, take some conscious breaths. Brain FM also has settings for relaxation, meditation, and sleep. So you can play around with that um, as well, but I'm pretty glued to their focus sessions. So this time block approach can also be explored with the Pomodoro technique, which maybe you've heard of too, I've mentioned previously. But in this scenario, you can Um, do shorter stints of work so maybe only 20 minutes or so and then have a timer go off and at each interval you know you just take a quick two to five minute break look away from your computer focus on something in the distance to relax those eyes uh, do some breath work or stretching at your desk it's super effective at increasing energy and mental focus and there's several apps that you can download related to this technique Mm, Awesome. I love this time block approach. And I do something similar by setting an alarm on my phone, usually for just over an hour, actually one hour and 11 minutes to be exact. Why? And I I just like, I feel lucky when I see those. I love that. One, 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 two, two, two. (laughs) Anyway, so I put my phone on airplane mode and then I make a promise to myself that I will stay on one task until the alarm goes off. So no checking emails, no Slack messages or social media, and then there's no texts coming in. So I'm nice and free from distractions. And sometimes it takes me a while to get into the flow with the work, but I always ultimately do. So when the alarm goes off, I usually am in a focused enough state that I'll just keep trucking and finish up a task if it isn't already finished. 
So binding my time and making a commitment to how I'm going to use it works really well for me to keep me focused. Of course, this can be tricky if you work in an office and are subject to meetings and other people's schedules, but I still like to recommend blocking out an hour each day on your own calendar to allow yourself some focused work time just for you. Yes. If the majority of your day is working with someone else's agenda, I mean, sometimes it's unavoidable, um, but it's essential, word of the day, right, (laughs) to (laughs) create those time blocks for yourself. This helps prevent us from reaching the end of the day or even the end of the week feeling like we haven't really accomplished anything that we wanted to. Mm, Yeah, which is so discouraging. Mm -hmm. Um, one other thing I wanted to call out is when I'm writing, there's a little app that I like to use and it's called Ohm Writer. And I really love the aesthetic of this app and the software designer's dedication to essentialism and focus. If you go to their website, which we'll link to in the show notes, you can see a little bit about their uh, perspective, but it's essentially a word processor paired with some good brain tunes, similar to what Michelle was talking about. And it, if you want it to, can take over your browser window, which really frees up distractions. So if you've never tried it, check it out. <laughs> Perfect. I actually, that I need to try that out because I'm one of those people who always has like 30 browser windows open. I know. <laughs> I've got a million tabs and the time and like, yeah. yeah. It's really, it can be really distracting. Oh, tab overload. Um, (laughs) But so now working remotely, either from home or as a straight up digital nomad sounds luxurious. And believe me, many times it feels that way, but it can also have its own downsides and challenges. Mm, I completely agree. I think we both have some portion of our work that is remote. You for sure. Mm -hmm. I have some of it. Um, And while working remotely can be freeing, it can also be challenging to get motivated to kick into gear when you're only accountable to yourself. If the only motivation is to put out fires or react swiftly to a client demand or a deadline, that can feel kind of crummy after a certain period of time. Plus, it doesn't position you to progress larger goals very well. I also think it can be challenging to kick out of gear when you're on your own clock. But I know Dr. Michelle has something to say about that. (laughs) Yes, I have something to say about a lot of things. I I might be somewhat opinionated, but (laughs) anyway, it can be tough to stay on track and create a disciplined routine for yourself. If you're not careful about it, you can find yourself checking emails at 8 p.m. and responding to clients' needs at all hours of the day. You know, these distractions Distractions can cause huge productivity issues because research has shown that for each distraction, it takes us about 15 minutes to get back into that flow state or back into the groove, as some people say. So you can take time blocks to a whole other level with this. For example, you can have a startup and close down routine or time block where you limit checking email to these times, maybe it's two or three times during the day, so you're not checking it and responding at all hours or with every notification that pops up. Personally, I need to literally close my mail app so that I don't see any of those notifications. It's it's tough at first, believe me, but you'll be shocked at how much more time you feel you have. Oh, I love what you just said about only checking emails at certain times of the day. And I... Remember in grad school, I had a professor that was really diligent about that. And he would tell the class at the start of the semester that he only checked emails at 10 a.m. and I think like 5 p.m. at night. And it was kind of cool to be on the receiving end of that boundary to know that, okay, if I'm going to, if I want a response from him for something to do the next day, I need to email him in the evening so he can catch it at 10 Mm. a.m. So I just just kind of throw out there that it can feel really good for the person that you're creating that boundary for to know when you are going to be checking emails and when you when to expect a response from you. I love that. That's a really cool Mm -hmm. spin on that. Um, Yeah. So going back to kind of time and, and feeling time, really, you know, time is a matter of 
perception, right? I mean, how many times have you felt that time was almost standing still? Maybe you were doing something you didn't quite like, <laughs> but then other t- <laughs> but then other times, you know, it seems like time just slips through our fingers. So mindfulness or bringing that um, awareness around what we're doing is a really great practice to help slow time down for us. All right, so back to working from home, it's also important to have boundaries there, right? Because we can be doing some focused work and then remember that we have to start a load of laundry. So we end up blending that work home life, which can severely detract from our productivity and the quality of work that we're doing. So obviously doing house chores is great and absolutely necessary and essential to maintain our sanity. So if you want to work this into your day, just be strategic about it. You know, create a time block where you dedicate 30 to 60 minutes to doing house chores. You know, it's a really nice reprieve from work and your computer screen so maybe these house chore breaks fit nicely between your dedicated two hour time blocks. Mm, I really like that strategy and bringing some intention to shifting gears, Mm -hmm. getting a brain break, and then also having the opportunity to cross something off the to-do list, which can be super motivating. Um, Related to that, kind of, sort of, is something that we talked about a bit in the Funky Five episode last week, and that's making time for some white space in your schedule to calm the mind and bring some play into your day. Which, here's the buzzword again, (laughs) is essential for generating good ideas. But white space and play are also super conducive to reducing stress and boosting the executive functions of the brain, which are the ones that you want to be really engaged when you're doing work. So how can you invite a little play into your day? There's lots of ways, drawing, singing, dancing, laughing. These are some of my favorites. For you, it might be totally different. Maybe try thinking back to how your childhood self loved to play. There may be some clues there that you can use to drop 30 minutes of play into your day and block out that time. Make it a priority to let your mind roam free. It will definitely pay off. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah. Play is definitely something I need to do more of, but I, you know, sometimes I also bring play into my exercise or my movement. So for instance, you know, I went on a 15 mile bike ride this morning, which is not only great for my body, but it's actually really fun for me. Like I really enjoy it. Just like the wind against my face, like the hills and like, it's just super fun. So um, yeah. (laughs) And I mean, I, I think I went on a lot of bike rides like as a kid too. So anyways, um, so kind of switching gears, you know, traveling and social events in our personal or professional life can really create their own challenges too. So depending on your health goals, you might need to plan and create boundaries around when you choose to go out, when you choose to retire for the night, or when and how much you decide to indulge in, you know, adult beverages or other food items that you might not otherwise touch, right? So this brings up another topic around empowering yourself in these situations. And I know from personal experience that it can be a bit challenging to stick to your guns and not feel like you Mm -hmm. have to explain yourself if you choose to do or not do something that's generally socially acceptable, right? So for example, with drinking alcohol. So once I entered my 30s, I noticed that I couldn't really tolerate alcohol as well as I could in my 20s. And I know now that my body has a really difficult time detoxifying. I actually recently found out from a strategic genetic test that I'm literally missing some key genes that help with detox pathways. So this creates a buildup of toxic byproducts that makes me feel horrible. It's like the mm-hmm. hangover from hell, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of saying, you know, I can't or I shouldn't do this, that, or whatever, which essentially takes the power out of our hands and 
are really disempowering statements. I try saying, you know, I choose not to or I do this instead, which are way more empowering. I was actually just recently on a six mile walk with my brother and towards the end, we were actually doing one of those walking club walks that we talked about in a previous episode. Oh, Do you yeah. yeah. So um, anyways, we were on one of those walks and toward the end, he mentioned that we were going to be passing this really awesome pizza shop and that <laughs> the smell was just going to be crazy intoxicating. But the thing is, is that he prefaced that statement by saying, I know you can't have it, but there's this pizza shop, yada, yada, right? And I totally corrected him in the moment and said, actually, I can have it, but I choose not to. And he totally got it. He's great. But you know, that's just one example. But as you can see, you can really use these strategies on the food spectrum too, right? I choose to be gluten-free because my body feels way less bloated and I have better energy throughout the day. So mm, totally, totally. Mm-hmm. I like this flip and the power of the words that we use is so huge. Mm-hmm. Personally, I like a good constraint. I feel like it fuels my creativity and gives my ideas something to bump up against. In fact, as a designer, I find that being crystal clear on the constraints, or you could call them the parameters or the boundaries or guidelines for the work, that really sets me up for doing my best work. And asking questions like, what amazing thing could I do if I only had X amount of time to do it? Or what's the most critical thing that this work is going to address? Or how can I make the most of using only the resources on hand? These kinds of questions can help you to hone in on what really matters and helps to reduce the choices that you have to make while still giving you the power to choose. So these kinds of questions are helpful when you're building a business or creating a meal or building a house. I mean, it can be applied to so many things. Totally. And I mean, how many of us have decision fatigue, right? So it takes out Mm -hmm. (laughs) too many decisions on one end, but then I feel like having those parameters or those boundaries, right, are also really stimulating to our brain because they help boost our problem solving abilities, which is always a good thing, right? (laughs) Absolutely. And I think we probably all have felt this in our work. If we create work for an ideal customer, say, we are creating within their parameters. Mm -hmm. And ideally, we're saying no to everything else because it's not essential to serving that customer or client. And we can use this same idea as we work for ourselves, doing the lovely work of designing our own lives. Mm. As we craft what we want our days, weeks, years to look like, we have to say no to the things that don't fit into that plan. So I'm taking a super macro view here, but having a sense of what's most important and a sense of the end goal is going to really help us to see what serves that goal and what does not. I enjoy bringing these ideas into my work with clients in a couple of ways. One, I like to get super focused on their goal and making changes to their diet and lifestyle or redesigning their life, if you will. Whatever that motivation is, it needs to be important enough to that design that they are willing and able to say no to all the things that do not serve their goals, which will make space for them to have a big fatty yes to the things that do serve them. So we try to stay grounded in that larger goal as much as possible. And similarly, having guidelines and constraints are a part of the daily challenges needed to work towards that goal too. So I love to play with a hell yes and hell no approach with food or lifestyle adjustments. So you can try this on yourself and feel free to bring some sass into it. (laughs) Hell yes is an add-in. So it's maybe something nutrient dense that you're going to commit to enjoying each day. And a hell no would be something that you're going to say no thanks to something that's not serving you. So that's anything that's energy draining or contributing to bloat or just a general sense of dullness. This strategy makes dietary change, something that can be challenging in general, a bit more empowering and doable because it's not a complete overhaul. It's, uh, I'm going to commit to this and I'm going to commit to not doing this. 
And plus, it's super fun to say, hell yes. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I actually really love this example of the hell yes and hell no approaches. You know, something that just came to mind was that if you can picture your future self in all the health and wealth and success that you desire, whatever that looks like, what are you doing right now that your future self would say hell yes or mm-hmm. hell no to? You know, what are you making excuses for? What are you cutting like or where are you cutting corners where, you know, where are you just like winning at life? So I don't know, just throwing that out there. <laughs> I love that. And it reminds me of something that Marie Forleo said. We brought her up last episode. Um, something that was really empowering to me was, uh, you know, how would you behave if you were like crushing it? Totally. In whatever you're, whatever you're doing, like, would you spend 30 minutes distracted on social media if you were the like top boss of your game? Totally, Probably not. totally. So I love that. I love it. Love it. Love it. Mm-hmm. I think one of the reasons the boundaries get compromised in general is that we want to please, or we want to be liked, or we want to look like we can do it all and be a go getter and those are all really seductive things, right? So it's not easy to turn away from those. But it does require a shift in mindset, one that understands that by doing less, we can do a few things better. And again, that book, Essentialism, is all about this concept, less but better. So doing the hard work of saying no and maybe disappointing someone in the short term could mean absolutely delighting and surprising them and others in the long term, not to mention delighting yourself in creating something fantastic while not burning yourself out to do it. Woo woo. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so as a little recap, here's what we talked about today. A lot, Michelle, we talked about a lot. <laughs> we did. <laughs> um, so we talked about boundaries at work are important because work impacts so much of our lives. We talked about time blocks being a super effective tool to create time for focus. And we will link to a couple of the apps and tools that we mentioned to support that in the show notes. We talked about startup and shutdown routines as a stellar way to start and end an effective workday. We also talked about the importance of claiming time and space in your day for play in order to manage stress and support great ideas We talked about choosing empowering language when choosing to say no and honor our boundaries. And finally, we talked about embracing constraints and boundaries to fuel a creative and well-designed life. Hell yes. Hell yes. (laughs) (laughs) all right ladies so thanks for tuning in next week i am so excited we are going to be interviewing a seriously badass lady boss natalie frank of the rising tide society she is an educator entrepreneur and community builder and she has led the rising tide society to mobilize tens of thousands of creatives every month in the spirit of community over competition. So I am beside myself with excitement. So I hope you can tune in. Also, I want to give a little shout out to our international listeners. So aside from from the US, which duh, thank you. uh, We have a good amount of women tuning in from Canada, the UK, Australia, Indonesia, Japan, Spain. So hello to you all out there. We're so stoked to be sharing the airwaves with you. So thanks for tuning in and ta-ta for now. Bye. Thank you for listening to Females and Fine Fettle from Wiped Out to Wealthy, a podcast to fit your lifestyle. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe, rate, and review at femalesandfinefettle.com. If you have questions or topic ideas for upcoming episodes, we'd love to hear from you. Please be sure to tune in next week.